Hello everyone, welcome to the Zoology Podcast. In my last podcast on the domestication of the silver fox, I ran out of time, which meant that I couldn't cover the really interesting and fascinating topic that almost stopped the domestic fox from even existing at all. And that thing is, how communism impedes science by promoting nonsense and uniformity. So if you'd like to hear more, please keep listening. If you had listened to the last podcast, you would have learnt that the silver fox domestication study is often reported as one of the most important long-term zoological studies ever undertaken. Yet in 1959, the very year it commenced, the work of Dimitri, the head researcher, and Trutt, his loyal assistant, came within a hair's breadth of being shut down by the premier of the Soviet Union. You see, the Soviet Union had a problem with genetics, seeing it as Nazi science, seeing it as a limiting factor in the ability for humans to become the social man, and therefore genetics and genital experiments were labelled as being pseudoscience, unaligned with communistic doctrine of the Soviet Union, and essentially experiments in Mendelian genetics were made illegal. This was all at a time when a true pseudoscience was running amok in the communist world, promoted by a scientist named Trofim Lysenko. Lysenko was a son of a peasant farmer in the Ukraine. He didn't learn to read until he was a teenager, and his education amounted to a correspondence degree from a gardening school. However, his background made him the perfect kind of person to elevate for the Soviet Union, because in the mid-1920s, the Communist Party leadership, in an attempt to glorify the average citizen, began to promote uneducated men from the proletariat into the scientific community. This meant that, even with no training, Lysenko was able to acquire in 1925 a middle-level job at a plant breeding laboratory in Azerbaijan. Despite not having the merit to be in such a position, Lysenko's work was promoted by a reporter of the Russian newspaper Pravda, a word that ironically means truth. It was in this newspaper that his story about how his pea crop yield was above average and how this had the potential to save a starving Soviet Union went viral. This was all wanted by the regime as it had planned to promote its peasant scientists. Over time, Lysenko would claim to increase the yields of wheat, barley, and other foodstuffs even during cold months of the year. Lysenko claimed that this was possible by freezing seeds for long stretches of time before planting them. He predicted that this method could double the yield of farmland in the Soviet Union in just a few years. However, the truth was that Lysenko never undertook any legitimate experiments on increasing crop yields. He simply fabricated data that his communistic masters would want to hear and they used this to promote Lysenko, their proletariat scientist, and this resulted in the phenomenon known as Lysenkoism. Lysenkoism promoted the idea that all organisms, if given the proper conditions, have the capacity through experience to be anything or do anything, and therefore the natural world could be communist in nature. This obviously attracted parallels with the social philosophy of Karl Marx, that promoted the idea that man was largely a product of his own will, which we now know to be absurd. Man like the feisty bonobo, the calculating orca, or the sturdy oak. Humans are not blank slates. The idea of Lysenkoism made it come into direct conflict with Mendelian genetics, which believed that traits could be passed down from parent to offspring, and the unit of inheritance was the gene, while Lysenkoists believed that it was not the gene, but experience itself that was a unit of inheritance. Ultimately, it didn't matter to the communists what ideas were situated in truth. What only mattered was that they could gain more political power. They found this power within promoting the lie that was Lysenkoism, other than the truth of Mendelian genetics, which had gained a bad rap in the Soviet Union due to its use by Nazi Germany in their attempts to build a master race. This got genetics labelled as a fascist science. And through the 1930s, over 3,000 geneticists were sent to labour camps and or executed. Then in 1948, genetics research was officially declared a pseudoscience and counter-revolutionary, resulting in the firing of all bourgeoisie scientists from their jobs as geneticists. That is the kind of power that could be shown when the leader of the Soviet Union, Joseph Stalin, was your ally. Lysenko, in July 1948, was placed in charge of all the policy regarding the biological sciences within the Soviet Union. 
The next month, at a meeting of the All-Union Lenin Academy of Agricultural Sciences, he presented a talk that today is regarded as the most disingenuous, dangerous speech in the history of Soviet science. In this speech called The Situation in the Science of Biology, Lysenko damned Mendelian genetics as modern reactionary genetics, to which the audience cheered loudly. But wouldn't you cheer for a lie if not cheering could get your life cancelled? Perhaps cheering is not enough, though, because the geneticists in the audience were forced to stand up and denounce their scientific pursuits. If they refused, they were to be thrown out of the Communist Party and therefore lose all the privileges that come along with it, be it their job or their life. The dangers in speaking out against Lysenko is perhaps best shown in the story of Nikolai Vavilov, one of Dmitri's intellectual idols. Vavilov was a botanist and explorer who travelled to 64 countries collecting seeds and ended up with more living plant specimens than any other person in history. This pursuit was fuelled by his need to find a way to propagate crops for his countrymen as he had witnessed three famines in his lifetime which had resulted in millions of Russians dying. Vavilov's research allowed him to meet and befriend a young Lysenko in the 1920s, before it became clear that Lysenko was a swindler. Vavilov soon became suspicious of Lysenko's research, so much so that he tried to replicate what Lysenko said he had discovered. Vavilov proved to himself and to others that were willing to listen to him that Lysenko was a fraud. He was then driven by conviction and became Lysenko's most fearless opposition. However, questioning Stalin's golden boy and Russia's proletariat scientists was to question communism itself, and within an ideology where there cannot be any diversity of thought, questioning and opposition must be punished. Therefore, Stalin retaliated by forbidding Vavilov from travelling abroad and he was denounced in the government newspaper Pravda. Lysenko warned Vavilov that, quote, When such erroneous data were swept away, those who failed to understand the implications would also be swept away. End quote. These threats did not deter Vavilov, and at a meeting of the All Union Institute of Plant Breeding, he declared the following quote, We shall go into the pyre, we shall burn, but we shall not retreat from our convictions. End quote. Then, in 1940, Vavilov was kidnapped by the Soviet Union's secret police, the KGB, and placed in the dreaded Lubyanka prison. He was then shipped off to a more remote prison, and there, over the course of three years, the man who aimed to make famine in Russia a thing of the past was ironically starved to death. You would think that this kind of fate would stop other scientists from speaking out, and it did. But even though his idol was dead, one brave man began speaking out against the dangers of Lysenkoism to all scientists who would listen, despite of the dangers, and whether they be his friend or his foe. And that man was Dmitry Believ, the head scientist of the Fox Domestication Experiment. In 1959, the Fox Domestication Experiment was just beginning, but Lysenko was getting frustrated that his hold on power within Soviet biology was ebbing away. He needed a target to remind people of his power, and the Institute of Cytology and Genetics, which had the audacity to put genetics in the title of the institute, was a perfect place to attack for being anti-communist. Which put the Fox domestication experiment that had just begun, and of which Dmitry was vice director, in the spotlight of evil. In January 1959, Lysenko created a committee whose purpose was to determine what sort of work was being done at the Institute of Cytology and Genetics. Dmitry his assistant Trutt and their colleagues understood the gravity of the situation. Trutt said, I quote, Committee members were snooping in the laboratories, and rumours were spreading that the committee was unhappy. End quote. When the committee met with the chief of the institute, Mikhail Lavrenchev, they told him that, quote, The direction of the Institute of Cytology and Genetics is methodologically wrong. End quote. Ominous words from a Lysenquist group but perhaps a result fixed from the start. In 1959, Nikita Khrushchev, now Premier of the USSR and a supporter of Lysenko, learned of the committee's report about the Institute and decided to pay it a visit on his way back from China. 
The staff of the Science Institute all gathered for this visit, and Trut said of this moment that Khrushchev walked by all the assembled staff very fast, not paying any of them any attention. Instead, he proceeded to a meeting with the administrators. Trot recalls that Khrushchev was very discontented due to the presence of geneticists. However, this cannot be corroborated, because the administrators, who must not have been very good at their jobs, did not record what was said on that day, but they did make it clear to the scientists that Khrushchev intended to shut down the Institute of Cytology and Genetics that very day, and along with it, Dmitri's silver fox domestication experiment. Fortunately for Dmitri, his foxes, his colleagues, and science, totalitarian systems can be fickle. Khrushchev brought with him on that day his daughter Rada, who was a journalist, a trained biologist, and someone who saw right through Lysenko. She managed to convince her father to let the Institute of Cytology and Genetics remain open. However, Khrushchev had to save face and show the communists that he was strong, and so he fired the head of the Institute of Cytology and Genetics, which ironically meant that Dmitri would now be in charge. However, if Rada Khrushchev had not taken a stand for science that day, the Fox domestication study would have likely ended before it even got off the ground. But it survived, and thrived, and continues to shed light on the process of domestication to this very day. Ultimately, Lysenkoism as a term has come to be identified with the deliberate distortion of scientific facts for purposes that are deemed politically or socially desirable. However, we need to acknowledge that the rock goes deeper than just that. It stems from an ideology that suppresses intellectual freedom, that requires its population to adhere to one type of thought, which leads to a culture of personal fear, self-censorship, and lies against reality. Luckily, Dmitri, Trut, and their foxes managed to outlive the communist regime, but we must always be vigilant against those ideologies that aim to silence dissent require uniformity, and request that you tell lies at the barrel of a gun. Veritas Liber Abit Vos